one of the truly incredible people who can tell us so much about uh, health, human health, animal health, longevity, nutrition, uh, all the good things that we want to hear and know about and, uh, and live longer and healthier. Uh, Dr. Wallace, if you know, his uh, credentials are lengthy, going back uh, as a uh, author, lecturer, medical researcher, uh, writer, uh, Lex, he just, you know, he, he wears so many hats and does so many things, so it's so, uh, we have such a good fortune to have him come here and help enlighten us more about being healthy today. So, without further ado, I'd like to bring out Dr. Joel Walsh. Okay, um, I want to thank you very much uh, for coming out. Um, really appreciate it. And uh, thank uh, Pete and his uh, lovely wife for helping us put all this together. Um, uh, just again, I think Pete did a pretty good job of introduction. But the thing that makes me different is that I do have a degree in agriculture. I'm a veterinarian. I wrote the first paper uh, regarding a mass die off in America from pollution back in 1991, was published in 92. I worked with Marlon Perkins, the old Mutual Omaha Wild Kingdom show. Some are old enough to remember him. I know there's some young ones in here only know the crocodile hunter. And um, uh, Perkins had me go to Africa when I graduated veterinary school and work on the white rhino and the Ele uh, African elephant conservation project. So if you see a white rhino in a zoo or a wild animal park, it's either one that I caught or offsprings. I caught 200 of them and sent them over here. Um, uh, and he called me back. Oh, there we go. Now we got some volume. But now it's a little too much. We cut it back a little bit. Hello, hello. That's good? Okay. Perfect. Okay. We're happy. Thank you. Thank you. Leo Rivers, yeah, thank you. And um, <clears throat> after two years, there, I, was, I was prepared to stay in Africa for the rest of my life because I had such a good time. Can't get you all the way back to the room, dear. All the way in the back. And my dad used to say, if you're on time, you're a half hour late. Okay. Um, and um, since I wrote that, that article on uh, the mass dial from pollution and had given him a copy, uh, he came up with a grant from the National Institutes of Health, $25 million. It's called the Center for the Biology of Natural Systems. And uh, that was a lot of money back then. It'd be the equivalent of billions of dollars today. <clears throat> and he called me back from Africa to be the pathologist on the project. And um, uh, to make a long story short, over a 10-year period, I did some uh, 20,000 autopsies and 10 million chemistries and and um, the book that came out of it's in the Smithsonian Institute is National Treasures, 1,200 pages. It deals with all the chemistries and autopsies and so forth. They had all the clinical records. It was quite, quite a thing. Looking for pollution as a contributing factor to chronic disease and death of natural causes. What I found out was that every animal, every human being, and I had done 20,000, some 17,000, some change were of over 424 uh, species of zoo animals and 3,000 humans. And every animal, every human being that died of what they call natural causes, not infections and not trauma, um, actually died of nutritional deficiency diseases. That was quite a shocker to everybody, uh, all documented about biochemistry. And uh, that began to save species because you may remember back in the 60s, the panda was just down to about a half a dozen pandas in the world in captivity. They were going to be extinct. And I was able to save them because they were feeding them uh, things like a bamboo grown in potting soil, you know, from Walgreens. And um, I didn't get enough nutrition, so I just gave them dry dog food, and now we have to give them birth control because there's so many pandas. <laughs> and that kind of simple stuff, okay? And um, yeah, I think next time, Pete, yeah. next time we set this up, it'd be very useful if we have an aisle down this right side, okay. so that when people come in late, they can go down that aisle instead of crisscrossing and shaking hands with all their buddies and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> okay, now before I get going here, uh, oh, I should tell you one more thing. Uh, as part of that project, they sent me from zoo to zoo, university to university over a period of 12 years. <clears throat> and, um, and my last project, was at the Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, and the Yerkes Primates Center was dealing with NASA monkeys and stuff like that. I just walked in, and within the first couple of months, I discovered the first non-human case of cystic fibrosis, thought to be a genetically transmitted disease. And in the project I had done with Marlon Perkins, where I did the 20,000 autopsy, I was finding human genetic diseases in animals, like type 2 diabetes and now crocodiles and 
sickle cell anemia and hummingbirds and antelope. And so I knew that the genetic thing wasn't correct, but I wasn't quite ready to pull the trigger to that publicly yet. It appeared in the scientific books and things, but it wasn't ready for prime time. But um, uh, when I found this one, because so many kids were involved, I got it all together, put it together, and realized that cystic fibrosis is not genetically transmitted, as is uh, generally thought uh, in the medical community. And did all the chemistry, found out the cause. Uh, there were 24 age peers in that colony that uh, were not related genetically to this one monkey that died of cystic fibrosis. Got permission to do biopsies on them. They all had cystic fibrosis. So I knew it was an environmental thing. And so I tracked it down, sure enough, the deficiency of a single mineral, gave it to the survivors, all that mineral went away, genetic markers went away. Got it written up and I asked the boss, you know, the, the head guy, the, uh, the chairman of the uh, Yerkes Primate Center to be able to publish it and he fired me. He said, everybody knows it's genetic. I said, well, can't we get a committee together like you do for PhD students and let them challenge me and see if I can answer their questions correctly or not, or fulfill, you know, their challenge? No, we'd be embarrassed to tears. They'd laugh us out of the university if we said that there was even a possibility that cystic fibrosis wasn't genetic. So that's when I went back to school, 1978, and became a physician. I've been practicing as a primary care physician for 36 years and using everything I'd learned in those projects uh, with the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, uh, many zoos, many big universities, uh, to treat my patients. And so I, I treat them quite differently than the average uh, physician. With that, are there any uh, people who are professionals in healthcare here tonight? Any professionals in healthcare? I know we have a dentist here, Dr. Feld, right? And who else do we have? Any, any, uh, yes, what do you do, sir? Medicine. You're a medicine, medical doctor? Okay, I appreciate you being here. What are you, what, what is your, uh, what is your uh, specialty? Emergency. Emergency, okay, very good, emergency room. Dennis. Dennis, okay, so we got a couple of dentists here. Anybody else in the healthcare professions? Okay, appreciate you being here tonight, and appreciate everybody being here tonight. I'm going to start out by just saying, uh, over the thousands of years that there's been physicians and philosophers and soothsayers and all that kind of stuff, uh, there's been thousands of failed medical theories every century. In the 20th century, the 21st century is no different. You have thousands of failed medical theories. And so we're going to go over some of the, the major ones. And it'll be kind of a shocker to everybody, including, I'm sure, our medical professionals. Take nothing personal. Uh, this just has to do with, with the reality of things. And some of the um, uh, failed theories have to do with arthritis. It's not genetic in any way, shape, or form. It's not even rheumatoid arthritis. It's not an autoimmune disease. Uh, they're all mineral deficiencies, except for rheumatoid arthritis, which is a bone-to-bone -bone arthritis, which is a mineral deficiency disease with a secondary infection with a bug called mycoplasma. You can kill it in two weeks with minocycline, which is a member of the tetracycline family. And uh, then we have diabetes, we've known for 70 years, it's not genetic, it's a simple disease, a uh, single mineral deficiency, I've known it for 70 years. When I did those autopsies on those animals and finding human um, diabetes, type 2 diabetes in crocodiles, I mean, did he eat a Baptist preacher who had diabetes and <laughs> somehow got the gene implanted in him? So I knew that this had to be an absurd thing when it came to uh, genetics. What about high blood pressure? Has nothing to do with salt, has nothing to do with genetics, even in the black community. Uh, heart disease uh, has nothing to do with uh, cholesterol. Uh, congestive heart failure is a simple deficiency of a single vitamin. We've known that uh, for 300 years. It was discovered by a Japanese naval surgeon. Uh, the um, uh, cardiomyopathy heart uh, disease, heart attack, is a sudden heart death in athletes and people who do hard physical work. Uh, this is caused by a deficiency of a single Mineral, I've done 1,700 autopsies on kids under the age of 10 in Qishan province, China, that have died from cardiomyopathy heart disease. 1,700 autopsies published in English here in the United States in, in the um, uh, several medical journals, and also in China in two languages and several medical journals. Um, coronary artery disease has nothing to do with cholesterol. Coronary artery disease, and I said this in 1971 in one of my publications, international papers, uh, is caused by inflammation of the lining of the arteries, and the or lining of the arteries then uh, react with scar tissue. It has nothing to do with cholesterol. That was a very, very badly failed medical theory. Um, billions of people have been killed all over the world with that theory. We'll get into that in a second. Um, the Nazis only killed 40 million. The theory that coronary artery disease is caused by cholesterol has killed over a billion people when you count all countries in the industrialized nation. And then Coronary thrombosis, we get a blood clot in a coronary artery and um, vascular disease in the brain, we get uh, um, cerebral thrombosis, uh, thrombotic stroke, 
This has nothing to do with cholesterol. It's actually caused by an omega-3 essential fatty acid deficiency or a ratio problem between omega-3, 6, and 9. That's one of my eight lawsuits against the FDA and federal court, and I prevailed in all eight lawsuits. Another one was I had to sue the FDA to get them to insist and demand that uh, folic acid was in human prenatal vitamins to prevent neurotrube defects like spina bifida. We had done that in animals since 1947, but medical doctors didn't want to do it in people, so I had to sue them in federal court to make them do it. Okay, and on and on and on. I can do thousands, but these are some of the ones we're going to talk about. Let's look at uh, some of these failed theories. How many of you ever heard of obesity? Anybody here hear of obesity? Raise your hand. You don't raise your hand, you're a lying commie. You all heard it. Obesity has nothing to do with lack of exercise and eating too much. Obesity is really due to a nutritional deficiency. And the symptom of the nutritional deficiency are deep cravings and, and the munchies and desires to eat things, binge eating. Those are the symptoms of these nutritional deficiencies. And I deal with people who are 300, 400, 600, 800 pounds. Those are the ones that I deal with. It's very easy to get them to lose two pounds a day, four pounds a day. They don't need surgery to deal with wrinkles and things like that after they lose the weight. And I'll show you some examples of that in a moment. The book that goes into the great detail, the earliest one was in 1994, called uh, Rare Earths of Cures, uh, touched on it, and Hell's Kitchen specifically talks about the cause, prevention, and cure of obesity, type 2 diabetes, and the metabolic syndrome. Obesity doesn't cause diabetes, and diabetes doesn't cause obesity. They kind of run together because they're all nutritional deficiencies. None of them have anything to do with um, genetics. None of them have anything to do with eating too many carbohydrates. Eating too many carbohydrates is a symptom of deficiency. If you choose you know, this big deal about high fructose corn syrup and the soft drinks, oh my God, they're going to paralyze the earth. No, no, no. The reason why people drink that stuff is because they have cravings to drink that stuff because they're nutritionally deficient. That's why pregnant women gain all that weight. And the embryos steal these nutrients from the pregnant women and they have cravings. And then how many of you heard that exercise is good for you? Raise your hand. Don't raise your hand or line Tommy, because I know you won't hurt them. <laughs> Let's look at professional athletes who get paid three, four, five million dollars per event per game. And we take all professional sports combined, the average lifespan of professional athletes is 62. That came out in 2004, published. And uh, professional football players, the average lifespan is 51. There's never been a professional athlete ever lived to be 100. What did I tell you about exercise? If exercise is all that good for you, here they are, they're being paid, they have personal trainers, they're supposed to eat well, they exercise, they train, they do everything they're supposed to do, and not one of them lives to be 100. People living under the bridge live to be 100. <laughs> <laughs> Dumpster diving behind McDonald's. All oh, those poor people are so, their lives suck, I mean, they gotta eat dog food. But that's why they live to be 100. <laughs> but dog food is perfect. <laughs> Well, the universal problem is that all athletes, regardless of sports, sweat, don't they? And what do they do when they sweat? They drink water. Well, some drink Gatorade, but most of them will drink water. Okay, but Gatorade could be, or Powerade, that sort of stuff. Well, and whatever it is, they're drinking water primarily, but a few of them will drink Gatorade, a few of them will drink Powerade. And sweat is not water. Sweat is a soup that contains all the nutrients floating around in your blood. Let's say you're not supplementing, you're getting 65, 70 nutrients that are floating around in your blood. What if you're supplementing, you're getting all 90 essential nutrients, which we'll get into in a minute, and um, you're sweating these 90 essential nutrients out in your sweat and you're drinking water. What's happening to the nutritional reserves in your body? It's going down. Now, why is it it's always the best, the top players that have knee problems and hip problems and tendon problems and ligament problems? Bam! And then they're dead. Why is that? The ones sitting on the bench never have a problem. They never sweat. Yeah, this is my specialty, of course, cardiomyopathy, heart disease. Again, I've done 1,700 autopsies published on that uh, big, big study. Uh, there's a 43-year-old gold medalist, Olympic gold medalist, who died of cardiomyopathy, heart disease at age 43. There's another gold medalist in swimming, died at 26, cardiomyopathy, heart disease. This guy's supposed to be the athlete's athlete, a Russian gymnast, died at 54, cardiomyopathy, heart disease. And I love this one, because billionaires, physical and health lives suck, because they can afford the best doctors, they can afford the best food, and that's what kills them. 
It's the best food, the best doctors. Because what does a top doctor tell you? No, Dr. Frank, sh shouldn't I be taking a supplement, boost or insure, or take a multiple or something? Oh, just eat while you're getting everything you need. Bam! You're dead. <laughs> <laughs> now, how many of you ever heard that salt has something to do with high pressure, particularly in the black community, and along with your genetics? How many of you heard that salt is bad in general for the cardiovascular system? Raise your hand. If you don't raise your hand, you're a liar. I didn't ask you to believe it. I asked you to heard it. Okay. Well, my audio cassette tape, which came out in 1992, Dead Doctors Alive, but, but by the way, how many of you? You ever heard the audio cast of the tape or the CD? Dead on? Okay. Okay. Ah, even, even the emergency room doctor heard. Okay, good. All right. And one of the things that made that audio cast set tape so controversial was there's eight things in there um, that I had actually rung up when I was dealing with all these autopsies back in the 60s and 70s, uh, which were failed theories, including the salt thing is bad. Salt is very, very good for you. It has two essential nutrients in it, sodium and chloride. You can't make stomach acid without the chloride. You can't make hydrochloric acid. You can't make um, uh, sodium bicarb, which is something your pancreas does to neutral, neutralize the stomach acid coming out of your stomach in your small intestine because of the enzymes your small intestine and pancreas require an alkaline environment, whereas your stomach requires an acid environment. Plus, you have all these uh, necessary cofactors, including sodium and chloride, that are required for all these chemical reactions in your, in your cells to work. And so any doctor who tells you to restrict salt should be put in jail. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious, because they kill people and they say restrict salt. It's like saying, now, no more oxygen for you. Okay. <laughs> Bam, you're dead. <laughs> well, the whole story about salt, you can find in Time Magazine, March 1982, salt and new villain, September 2014, salt doesn't cause high blood pressure, even in black. Now, there's a lot of, well, here's a study that was done by Loyola University, uh, Chicago Medical School. Um, they published the first reports in the Scientific American in February 1999. Six years later, January 2005, they came out with this um, bottom line study, which they published in the British Medical Journal, said, high blood pressure in blacks not genetic. January 2005. I said it in 1971 when my book was published, 1200 pages. Right? Then, of course, there are herbs that will do a better job in lowering blood pressure compared to pharmaceuticals with no negative side effects. This came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association, August 2003. It said dark chocolate has flavanols in it, a natural substance in dark chocolate, which lowers blood pressure without complications and causes. Uh, death and injury and all the other complications of high blood pressure medication, or 1-800-BAD-DRUG kind of thing. And uh, so we immediately came out with a liquid dark chocolate, which I like the liquid. It's called Coco Jevity. I put it in my Java Fit Coffee, which is our brand of coffee. We're the, kind of like the third largest coffee company in the world. Oops, that's the Russian version. <laughs> okay, Coco Jevity, you put like an ounce of this in your cup of Java Fit Coffee, you get a mocha cafe, I mean lowers your blood pressure, antioxidants in coffee, does great things for you. And if you're like me, you travel a lot, uh, we have pieces the size of a pat of butter, which have the same flavanols in it, triple treat chocolate, and they have probiotics and more calcium and that kind of stuff. Really great, great chocolate. You won't like it. It tastes like chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> now, have you ever heard of cardiovascular disease? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Have you ever heard of cholesterol being associated with cardiovascular disease? Raise your hand. Okay, well, the approach that the medical system has for cardiovascular disease is if you have obstructed arteries in your heart, um, they put stents in, they do bypasses, they do heart transplant, all that kind of stuff, and they forget that when you have a two millimeter wide obstruction in a descending coronary artery, you also have the same obstructions in your arteries in your brain. You get, you get vascular dementia, you get strokes, you get uh, carotid artery obstruction, you get obstruction of the artery in your eye, you get glaucoma, you get obstruction of arteries in your kidneys, you get kidney failure and dialysis and all that kind of stuff. And they forget about all the rest of that. They just want to put that stent in. And then, then they want to do the bypasses. And then 
They want to do the heart transplant, and pacemakers, and defibrillators, and do uh, ablation, and retroversions, and all these things, and none of it's really a heart problem. None of it's cholesterol. There's not a single cardiovascular disease that's caused by cholesterol. Congestive heart failure, again, is caused by deficiency of a single vitamin. We've known that for 300 years. Cardiomyopathy heart disease, a deficiency of a single mineral. Coronary artery disease, where you're getting plugged arteries, has nothing to do with cholesterol and saturated fat. It has everything to do with inflammation. Eating fried foods, processed meats with nitrates and nitrites. Oils that turn into trans fatty acids, heterocyclic amines and acrylamide. Chemicals far worse than anything that Dow Chemical and Monsanto, or as Char says, Mean Santo, will put together, right? Well, this whole demonization of cholesterol and saturated fat was put together by, make a long story short, put together by Procter & Gamble and the American Heart Association. About 1936, Procter & Gamble gave the American Heart Association $1.7 million, which was an enormous amount of money back at that time, to endorse their new product, which they wanted to replace lard and, and cream and butter as cooking sharpenings. And the synthetic product was actually originally made in 1901 uh, by the German Navy as a lubricant. Somebody's clicking a pen or something over here. Click it, click it, click it, click it, click it. Please stop it. Whoever's doing it over here. Um, it's, a, um, it's a synthetic lubricant for diesel engines for submarines. Now, Procter & Gamble started out, they wanted to sell it as a soap, and they couldn't sell it as a soap in the 1930s because everybody's still making their own soap. They decided they were going to sell it as a food. Remember, this is a diesel engine lubricant. They gave the American Heart Association $1.7 million to endorse this product as safer to eat than butter, cream, and lard. It was all a sales campaign, and they came up with the Mediterranean diet as a sales campaign core to sell this product. There was no facts to back this up about the Mediterranean diet. In fact, they, they originally called it the Seven Countries diet because they looked at Italy and, and Malta and Greece and, and France and Spain and Portugal. And they really couldn't get what they were looking for, so they rendered it down to the seven, 75 guys on Malta Island who were in their 80s still working out in the fields. They said, see, here's the proof that the Mediterranean diet works. The Mediterranean diet means you need all these polyunsaturated oils, not saturated fats and cholesterol. And the whole product was to sell was Crisco. <laughs> now, a year ago, there was a two full page article in Wall Street Journal telling this story. Now, I spent 35 years looking for the pivotal paper that showed that cholesterol and saturated fat were the demons that they said they were. Now, I'm a pathologist, I never could find it. The reason I could never find it, those papers never existed. It was always a sales campaign to sell Crisco. And of course, by the 60s and 70s, they had uh, pretty much demonized cholesterol and saturated fat. In fact, the first Good Housekeeping seal of approval, uh, Procter & Gamble gave the Good Housekeeping magazine uh, an enormous amount of money to do a full-page color ad. What they wanted was Norman Rockwell, the American uh, painter who does Americana paintings, to um, do a painting of Thanksgiving with a deep fried turkey, deep fried in Crisco instead of a roasted turkey. And he wouldn't do it because his grandmother and his mom still like lard and cream and butter to cook with. They still wanted the roasted turkey. So they got a Norman Rockwell esque painter. And this came out in 1962, which is the first good housekeeping seal of approval paid for by Procter and Gamble. And it shows these kids eating deep fried turkey parts, okay, deep fried in Crisco. The new Crisco, made to help take the fat worry out of good eating, highly unsaturated. Only the new Crisco has double the preferred unsaturates. Bam! You're dead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 1991, the New England Journal of Medicine, very well respected, published by the Harvard Medical School. Um, Dr. Kern wrote an article. It was kind of a, it was a kind of a case report and a letter to the editor, kind of combined. It was a story of a single patient, and, and Dr. Kern uh, was the professor of medicine at um, the University of uh, Colorado School of Medicine, and he was showing a group of graduated medical doctors who were formerly just students. Uh, they were getting ready to do the residencies and internship, and he was showing them how to examine seniors properly as opposed to pediatrics. 
He came across this chart in the pile. It was an 88 year old guy. He said, Oh, this is the one I want to show you guys. He goes in the room, and the guy looks like he's 50. And he's looking around. He says, Is this you? I say, Yeah, yeah. Is this your birthday? Yeah, that's me. He says, My goodness gracious. Um, tell me what you attribute your young looks and, and the fact that you're, all your laboratory blood work says you're 50 years old. What do you attribute that to? And the guy threw his shoulders back, uh, threw his chest down, and said, Well, I eat 25 eggs a day. Been doing that for the last 17 years. I'm going to do it for the next 100 years. <laughs> and so this guy says, Well, why on earth? Are you eating 25 eggs a day? The guy throws his shoulders back, throws his chest on, and says, because it makes me more studly. <laughs> now I want you to appreciate that testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, and adrenal hormones are steroid hormones, and they're 95% by weight cholesterol. You want a cholesterol-restricted diet, you want a cholesterol-lowering drug, you know, statin drugs, there ain't nobody home anymore. <laughs> it was a field day. For pharmaceutical companies that came up with Viagra, Cialis. There goes that pen again. I heard it click over here. <laughs> Somebody did it. You're guilty, whoever you are. Okay. Okay. And adrenal, adrenal exhaustion and vegetarians, all caused by cholesterol deficiency. Now, the most terrible disease. Physician caused disease did not exist 40 years ago, 45 years ago. Today's the number four killer of adults over the age of 65 is Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is a cholesterol deficiency. 75% of your brain weight is the white matter of the brain, called myelin, the insulation material of the brain. When it goes away, the naked nerve fibers all tangled out, and that's the microscopic um, diagnostic feature of Alzheimer's disease. You get these nerve tangles. Because short circuiting in the brain, you can't remember anything. Some people get a little violent and angry and that kind of stuff along with the dementia. Say, physician caused disease. You think you're doing a good thing by eating egg white omelets and egg beaters, giving up red meat? Bam! You're dead. <laughs> You'll die in your doctor's nursing home. He owns them all. You'll die in your doctor's nursing home with Alzheimer's disease because he gave it to you on a, on a restricted diet. And I have to tell you, before I go on, is that the uh, FDA in February of 2012 sent an email to all licensed medical doctors in America saying, look, urgent stop. Do not write prescriptions for statin drugs anymore. Stop it. They listed them, Lipitor, Zocor, Mevacor, and many of the others, and they said, um, do not recommend gluten, excuse me, do not recommend uh, cholesterol restricted diets for your patients. Particularly, don't do both of those in the same patient. Otherwise, you're going to increase the risk of type 2 diabetes by 52% and Alzheimer's disease by 100%. Well, four months later in June of 2012, in Science News, there was a wonderful article, lead article, and it said, good cholesterol, not beneficial. Much is the opposite of what your doctor says. And then went on to say, high levels of HDL, high density lipoprotein, the good cholesterol, will not reduce your risk of any type of heart disease. Because I already told you, there's not a single type of heart disease or cardiovascular disease that has anything to do with cholesterol, it's saturated fat. Congestive heart failure is deficient due to a single vitamin. Cardiomyopathy heart disease deficient in a single mineral. Coronary heart disease due to inflammation eating fried foods, processed meats, and oils and gluten. And coronary thrombosis and thrombotic stroke is due to not cholesterol and saturated fat, but omega-3 essential fatty acid deficiency in a ratio of problem between omega-3 and 6 is not. Which one of those is caused by cholesterol? Zero, nada, zippo. But yeah, your doctor continues to write prescriptions for statin drugs. And he does. You want to go home tonight, sit down, and say, I apologize, sir, but I have to fire you because you really don't care much about me because you're still prescribing statin drugs. What I've learned about what the FDA said about them, you shouldn't be prescribing to me. And so I'm going to let you know that I don't like it, and I'm going to make my voice clear by my checkbook and say you're fired. I'm going to find another doctor. Because you didn't think enough of me to forward that email to me that the FDA sent you. Oh, here it is. In 2009, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics wanted to get in on this largesse, wanted to get in on this money dealing with uh, 
cholesterol lowering drugs. Said, Listen, we're going to start giving statin drugs to kids under the age of eight. By the time they're 35, they won't have heart disease because we will have stopped it. Well, if you do that, none of your children will live to be 25. Do not buy into that. Do not start giving statin drugs or low cholesterol drugs to your kids. And you'll see more why in a moment. Again, here's this Science News article. I didn't remember if it was the beginning here or the end. Maybe it's both places. Good cholesterol levels are beneficial. This is June 2012. High resale levels don't reduce heart attack because cholesterol has nothing to do with heart attacks of any kind. The culture on Earth that has the fewest cardiovascular events for the Inuit Eskimos above the Arctic Circle has been more than a dozen scientific articles published in cardiology journals in the United States and the rest of the world. The Inuit Eskimos above the Arctic Circle, their cholesterol is run 350 to 500. 98% of the traditional diet is walrus meat and walrus blubber, whale meat and whale blubber, seal meat and seal blubber, bear meat and bear fat. They do not eat vegetables or fruit. They don't eat grains or nuts. Again, their cholesterol is run 350 to 500. They do not get cardiovascular disease they, until they come down to desert hot springs and eat like you. <laughs> <laughs> then they go back up above the Arctic Circle and eat like Eskimos do, and it all goes away. It's the opposite of what your doctors say. Here's the whole story of cholesterol in three covers of Time magazine. Ansel Keys, who's on the board of the American Heart Association, on the board of Procter & Gamble. I mean, he even looks like a Nazi. Professor <laughs> <laughs> of Medicine at um, uh, the medical school at uh, the University of Minnesota, Minneapolis. And he brokered the deal between Procter & Gamble and the American Heart Association. Procter & Gamble had given them $1.7 million to endorse Frisco as a healthier way to eat and cook instead of butter and cream. He said, oh, he was a wonderful guy. Made the cover of Time Magazine a hero. He saved the American heart by getting us aware of cholesterol. Well, by the 1980s, his cholesterol was demonized. Everybody knew it was bad. Well, here comes June 23rd, 2014 cover article. Eat butter. Scientists labeled saturated fat the enemy, but why they're wrong. Tell the whole story of Ansel Keys and how he brokered the deal and how Procter & Gamble American Heart Association screwed you for $1.7 million. Remember, the Nazis murdered 40 million people during the Second World War. Guess what? Statin drugs have killed over a billion people. And here's just a greater look at that one cover. Time Magazine had the guts to do it, to put it on there, as bold as they could make it. The next major failed theory of the 20th and 21st century is genetics. There's not a single disease that's transmitted by genetics. There's not a single birth defect that's caused by genetics. All birth defects are caused by nutritional deficiencies of the embryo. All of them. Everyone you can name in 10 times that many you can't. We've eliminated all birth defects you can name in 10 times that many you can't in the animal industry by supplementing them with all known essential nutrients, 90 essential nutrients, 60 minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 essential amino acids, 3 essential fatty acids. And every genetic disease or autoimmune disease you can think of, everything from lupus and Huntington's disease and cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, uh, kidney failure, um, lupus, all that kind of stuff, um, rheumatoid arthritis, none of these things have anything to do with anything doctors have said. These are the, amongst the thousands of failed medical theories of the 20th and 21st century. The doctors have built their livings on it, and so why would they change? By 2003, they had the human genome mapped out. There were seven, oh, 850, 850 biotech companies that spent trillions of dollars looking for screening tests to look at these little kids that are under two years of age. Oh, he's got a bad gene. He's going to get Alzheimer's disease by the time he's 62. He's going to get heart disease by the time he's 45. He's going to wind up with the lupus when he's uh, 37. And they make a gene in the laboratory and displace the bad gene with the good gene they made in the laboratory. I mean, that's the theory, right? Well, by March of uh, 2013, 60 years after Watson and Crick had proposed the double helix as a structure of DNA, 60 years later, there had not been a single disease thought to be genetically transmitted, prevented, or cured with genetic engineering. And the people who were in the genetic engineering business started to get nervous because of all this failed theory background here. They think, uh oh, Houston, we may have a problem here. They contacted James Watson, one of the two, James Watson, Francis Crick, uh, Francis uh, Watson and Crick, the guys who got the Nobel Prize for the double helix structure of DNA. And, and Watson had become the director of the Cold Springs 
a genetic laboratory in New York for the federal government, and this guy had his finger on the pulse of genetics, right? So they asked him to come to the University of California, San Diego, to the Salk Institute, March 22nd, 2013, and give a report. We didn't know where we're at. How close are we to finding a prevention or a cure for a genetic disease? Which one? Which one? It's going to happen next week, two years from now. Where are we at? We, we don't know. We're groping around. We're spending trillions of dollars and nothing's happening. We want to know where we're at before we move forward. So they gave him to speak in front of an illustrious crowd of 300 people. 150 of them were Nobel Prize winners. 150 were heads of departments of genetics and um, biochemistry in medical school in America. And here's what he said from the stage in front of this illustrious audience. I'm going to quote him now. He said, I apologize, by the way, I just realized I'm a traveling folks. I'd normally be a little more dressed up, but uh, we had a tight schedule today, and be, we'd be two hours late if we went to the hotel and went on comms and all that kind of stuff and came back here. So I apologize for being traveling folks. Anyway, he got in front of this illustrious crowd, and he said, you can, you can, none of what we thought was genetically transmitted is. It's all chemistry, biochemistry, a.k.a. nutritional deficiency. That room went into an uproar. And then James Watson was terminated by the federal government for racial profiling. Do you understand what happened there? They fired him for the same reason they fired me from the Hercules Primary Center. But they, yeah, for telling the truth, they didn't want their empires to go away. They'd rather kill a bunch of kids rather than lose their jobs or have to change their thinking. Well, how many of you ever heard the term epigenetics? Okay, that's kind of funny. Everybody on this side of the room has heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, my 14 books I've written for the general public, all of which are bestsellers, including this one, it's only been out for a year and it's already a bestseller, Epigenetics, The Death of the Genetic Theory of Disease Transmission. This is me in 1977 with one of my cystic fibrosis monkeys at the European Primate Center in Atlanta, Georgia. And this is what's replacing genetics, epigenetics. Epigenetics is a word that deals with potential. Why don't you think of epigenetics as you would a Lamborghini car. Let's say you've, you've been gifted a Lamborghini car and you're, while you're anxiously reading the, you know, the uh, uh, maintenance manual, it says uh, this car will go 300,000 miles without the need for even a tune-up in the engine. But to accomplish that, you're going to have to change your oil every thousand miles. It has to be this very special oil, 25 bucks a quart, 150 bucks every thousand miles. And then this engine will go 300,000 miles. So let's say you're Scotch, you don't want to spend that money. Buy a quart of a gosh one. It's expensive. And so you get six quarts of Texas dirt, or six quarts of dirt from Alberta, Canada, and you put it in that car. It says six quarts of oil. And say, there's oil in Texas. There's oil in Alberta. There's bound to be some oil in that dirt. Is that car going to go 300,000 miles? No. It might not even go around the block because there's sand and that dirt and so it's going to seize up the engine and so forth. If that car has the potential of 300,000 miles, it might not go the distance certainly one tank of gasoline would take. It. You just put dirt from Texas or Alberta, Canada in there. The death of the genetic theory of disease transmission. I'm going to show you a couple of slides from a special issue of National Geographic, January 2012 on epigenetics. They looked at identical twins, kind of like what Hitler was doing, but they didn't kill these kids like Hitler did, but they looked for the, for the same reason. And um, these are identical twins, identical DNA, they're born two minutes apart. But to me, this one looked as a primary care physician. This gal here looks like she's maybe four or five years older than this one. They look like sisters, but not identical twins. This one's an inch taller, look at their ears, inch taller. Uh, her eyes are closer together, than even with the ground. Uh, this one's eyes are almost oriental, they're kind of upset here. Their noses are different, their chins, uh, her chin is almost double the length of this one's chin. Her lips are fuller, like she's gone through puberty, this one hasn't gone through puberty. Their hairlines are different, the shapes of their face are different. Okay, they look like an older and younger sister, as opposed to identical twins. Well, how did that happen? Their DNA is identical, and um, they're born just moments apart. Well, maybe this one gave her gummy bear vitamins to the dog under the table because she didn't like them. They stuck in her teeth. Maybe she didn't eat any carrots, and this one ate double the amount of carrots. Just that small amount of difference in what they took in their bodies make this much difference. And this is called epigenetics. The medical system has a pea-brained idea that genes are autonomous. They're going to do what they're going to do no matter what's going on around them. 
But genes and DNA and RNA and, and, and telomeres, the little end caps in your chromosome, are nothing more than blueprints. Now, can you build a house with blueprints alone? No. You need brick, you need wood, you need nails, you need mortar, you need electrical wiring, you need uh, sewer pipes, and you need copper pipes to get water into your kitchen or your shower, uh, you need flooring, you need shingles for the roof, you need glasses and windows and all that kind of stuff, you need concrete for the foundation, the basement, your genes and DNA and RNA are the same way. If you just eat well, you're not going to make it. If you depend on what may or may not be in the food you eat, you're screwed. But my doctor said all they have to do is eat well. The average lifespan of doctors, according to their own survey, which came out in 1999, published in six different medical journals, because they want to repeat what I said. I said they lived to be 58. They didn't like that. They said, well, I've got to be lying. That can't be right. That's what, that was another one of the eight controversial things that was in my audio cassette tape in 1992. Dead doctors don't lie. If Wallach lied when they came out with theirs in 1999, the average medical doctor in America does not die at uh, 58 like he says, we die at 56. <laughs> and the reason why they didn't care that they showed they died two years earlier was they wanted to show that my science was bad. <laughs> That's how crazy they are. Okay, I'm going to show you two more sets of identical twins, part moments apart, identical DNA. To me, they look like cousins. They don't look like even sisters. Um, look at, again, the, the length of her chin versus the length of her chin. Look at the width of the lips. Uh, her eyes are also upset here. Hers are parallel with the ground. Look at their noses. They're quite different. Hers come straight out. This one's nose comes down. This one looks like she's been bent crunching 400 pounds. she got a neck like a fullback, and this one's neck is very slim, very feminine. <laughs> These two guys are born moments apart, have the same DNA. They're one, uh, identical twins. And... Um, the guy on your right, I wouldn't get in a car with him, even with a loaded gun. <laughs> Anybody ever looked like a serial killer or Jeffrey Dahmer? You know, he looked like the kind of guy who would eat you after he killed you, right? And of course, here's the identical twin brother. He looks like he's lost. I mean, he is a confused puppy. Yeah, he probably has... Um, OP, you know, what is it, OCD, uh, obsessive compulsive disease, he also, you know, depressed, and maybe even uh, got a little bit of uh, ADHD or something like that. I mean, and they're the same, same genetic, but their shapes of their faces are just totally different. And that just happened during their sort of pre-teenage years as they're growing up and what they're eating, what they're not eating. Well, Wallach, there's got to be genetics because I have three generations of type 2 diabetes in my family. It's got to be genetics. Nope, absolutely not. How many of you ever heard of gluten intolerance? Raise your hand. 78% of Americans are gluten intolerant. Mm -hmm. Most people don't even know you. The doctors don't know what gluten intolerance does. Remember, I'm a pathologist. Gluten intolerance <clears throat> actually acts on your intestines like poison ivy does in your skin. When you put poison ivy juice on your skin, you're not getting an allergic reaction. You get what's called a contact dermatitis. It's like you put battery acid from your car battery in your arm as a contact dermatitis. When you're gluten intolerant, you're eating gluten, you're going to get what looks like somebody who's been eating poison ivy for salad. But that's how it affects the lining of your intestines. Okay, these villi, which rhythmically move, move food along, increase your absorptive surface by 85%. So your stomach is not just a smooth tube like a garden hose. These begin to go away. And you can get blood, you can get appendicitis, you can get diverticulitis, you can get celiac disease. You get irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, you get colitis, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's disease. All these are caused directly by their variations on gluten intolerance. Eczema, dermatitis, psoriasis, rosacea, asthma, bronchitis, and multitudes, as you can imagine, multitudes of nutritional deficiencies. Once you lose 85% of the absorptive surface of your intestine, even if you're supplementing, you can't absorb enough to prevent these diseases. I'm chronically anemic and I still take iron. I just get constipated, get black bowel movement, but I can't get angry with my iron deficiency anemia. Well, you're not absorbing it. They're gluten intolerance. I'm gluten intolerant. I'm gluten free. You have a dog? Yep. Yeah, you, your dog feed you give him have rain? Oh, yeah. Got to be more rain. Good for him. Well, that's where you're getting your gluten from the dog food. It's the dust from the dog food. <laughs> if you're married and your spouse and you're gluten intolerant, your spouse won't give it up. Change the locks in the house. <laughs> a washing machine, a, 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 a microwave, and a refrigerator, and a bed in the garage. Put a little note, email a note saying, I've changed the lock, I've changed everything, and have living quarters in the garage, and you're going to stay out there until you 
or become gluten free. Want to come back in the house with me? You have to be gluten free for three months before you come in. <coughs> Better start now. <laughs> You're gonna find out if they love you or not. <laughs> My favorite Time Magazine cover is from December 2008. Because it tells us where we're at. Does the starry state of American health? Remember, this is December 2008. Despite technological advances in medicine, Americans are less healthy than we used to be, and our next generation are kids to be worse off. How many of you have heard that our children will be the first generation that do not live as long as their parents? Raise your hand. Oh, look at that. Almost everybody in the room. Now, that prediction will come true if you don't change what you're doing. Half of you in this room, at least half of you in this room, will be standing graveside bearing your children if you do not change what's going on right now. Okay? Medical system is not going to change. Doctors are not going to change. The government's not going to change. You're going to have to do it. You're going to become a student of this information, which I'm going to show you from here on out. If you do that, you can interrupt that prediction. That prediction is preventable. If you take action. If you do not take action, your children are doomed to die before you do it. It will be an ugly, expensive, miserable, painful death for them. That's how serious this is. People say, well, why are you so rough on doctors? Well, I married a microsurgeon who taught at Harvard Medical School. It's not that I have a hard time with doctors, but there are no laws requiring them to cure that are available. Let's say rheumatoid arthritis, I can cure that in two weeks. If it's a bug, I can kill that bug with a minocycline. Remember, the tetracycline family in two weeks, then you take the healthy bone and joint pack. In a couple months, I can support remote mainstream repair, cartilage, ligament, tendons, connective tissue, discs between the vertebrae, and all goes away. But if they treat you for 25 years, these aren't replacements, you know, Trexate, gold shot injections, and all these things, Amber, oh, 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 you can pick up a piece of paper like a golfer. Like you on TV, right? Well, guess what? He makes $750,000 to treat you for 25 years. He only makes $300 to cure you. There's no law requiring him to cure you, and there's a cure bill. So let's see. Let's do a little figuring here. Which one is he going to choose most of the time? He can sure choose to treat you. That's why, with the exception of antibiotics, I can cure syphilis in two weeks with penicillin. I can cure bacterial meningitis. I can cure bacterial pneumonia with antibiotics. Antibiotics are the only drug that pharmaceutical companies make to cure you. All other, all other drugs are purposely built to treat the symptoms. Because that's how they make their money. If they cured you in three days, they wouldn't make their money back from all the research they did. So they build drugs and only relieve the symptoms of the disease, never cure it, even though cures are available. You are an ATM machine. Do you understand that? You know what made it worse? It was health insurance. Health insurance is the worst possible thing for human health. Because let's say you have a chronic anemia, and you've been given iron supplements, you can't fix it because you have gluten intolerance, you can't absorb it, he's never told you to get off of gluten. Well, the only thing left here is a bone marrow transplant, $140,000, don't worry about it, insurance will pay. Oh, goody, goody, goody. <laughs> Bam, you're dead. <laughs> but then he still gets paid. <laughs> Now, the Time Magazine seems to have a vendetta against doctors. Medical costs. Doctors are just wrapped in money and insurance policy. Why do you think medical doctors use the snake as part of their logo? In the old Bible days, who was it that brought knowledge that only God had to Eve? It was a serpent, wasn't it? And since doctors want to be gods, they said, we're going to really embrace that serpent, just in case that was correct. Because we want to know everything God knows, and the serpent's going to give it to us. Let's get a few more here, and we'll get into diseases. But we have to look, it's only fair that we look, since I'm, I'm pointing a finger here, it's only fair that we Look at the record, okay? Let's look at the scorecard. Is that fair? Just like you look at a scorecard of a professional athlete, an Olympic athlete, you look at a scorecard of a teacher. Let's look at a scorecard of a doctor. 
Let's look at um, the AARP, American Association of Retired People. How many have heard of AARP? Let's look at their monthly bulletin. The cover story, March 2012. The worst place to be in America when you're sick is an American hospital. The number of American patients who die each year from American hospital errors or simple errors is equal to four jumbo jets crashing each week. Let's be conservative and say 1,500 a week, 3,000 every two weeks, that's 6,000 um, a month, 72,000 a year. How many of you would fly American Airlines if you knew that they killed 72,000 passengers every year from simple <laughs> navigational errors? How many of you would eat Taco Bell if you knew they killed 72,000 patrons every year from simple errors in the kitchen? Newsweek magazine cover article came out. What is this? Uh, that's not the date. Oh, there we are. Here, August 2011. August 2011. The one word that's going to save your life from the medical system. <clears throat> this is the centerfold of that issue of Newsweek magazine, August 2011. This is the end of the month, and here's these doctors coming towards their patients. They look like good Christian doctors approaching the patient to give them help. You know, they look like they're desperate because they have a Mercedes payment and don't have the money. <laughs> and so the one word that's going to save your life is no. No! Do you realize when you put a roof on your house or a sprinkler system in your yard, you're going to get five different quotes and bids. You check them out, you render down to the last two, which you think are the best. Before you sign the contract, you take them now to Angie's list. The old days, you take them to Better Business Bureau and see if they didn't finish their work, if they, you know, had complaints about the quality of their work. And then you would choose. You go to the same doctor for 25 years, never get a second opinion on any advice he gives. I'm gonna rip your heart out and put some dead guys right in. Oh, okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Don't worry about it, Fred. Insurance can pay. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> And then Reader's Digest, of course, a fuzzy, warm little magazine. Every doctor and dentist has this in their waiting room, right? Mm -hmm. Because they always have the greatest love stories. You know, dog pulls kid out of the house fire by the collar. Uh, little four-year-old Lucy called 911 and says grandma when she had a heart attack. And so most doctors and dentists never read these things. They just throw them to the lobby because they don't want to be warm, fuzzy stories. But I guarantee you this one. But not in the way room of any doctor. <laughs> June 2007. Now this does not say, if you look, if you look here, this doesn't say fatal hospital stage you can avoid. It doesn't say that. That's what it looks like it says, but it doesn't say that. What it says is, <laughs> hospital stage you can avoid. Look at the size of the font. Look at the colors, blood red. So why don't you look at Angelina Jolie. Had her breast cut off because she had the genes, you know, for breast cancer. Oh. I've been saying this since the 1960s and 70s when I'm doing all those autopsies. All the genetic stuff they were saying was wrong, as I'm seeing it on the autopsy table, 454 species of animals, 3,000 humans, and it, it got pretty ugly there, right? Well, Angelina Jolie believed the doctor, the OBGYN, that had a breast cut off. Well, in today's newspaper from San Diego, all the data they've accumulated actually disputes claims that there is a gene for breast cancer, do not get your breast cut off if your doctor claims you have breast cancer. Big headlines in the San Diego newspaper today. And I said that in 1971, which is what, 45 years ago. Because the genetic theory is one of the failed medical theories of the 20th and 21st century. This is one of my favorite stories because they show you the sources of, of the figures that they get. There's a full page story, full page, February 5th, 2007, USA Today. Look at the title, Page Protect Thyself. And they got the story from the um, Institute of Medicine, which is the ethics watchdog for the medical profession, the Journal of the American Medical Association, which is the uh, most prestigious medical journal, certainly in America, maybe the world. And then the Center for Disease Control, which I used to do some work for when I was in Atlanta at the European Primate Center. Um, the tracks this kind of stuff. And this is a yearly figure I'm going to give you. This is a yearly figure that they gave. It's not a lifetime of accumulation. This is a yearly figure. Every year, they said every year in America, medical doctors kill, injured, and infect 15 million patients in hospitals and clinics. Every year. 
right here in America, medical doctors kill, injure, and infect 15 million patients in their hospitals and clinics. Nobody gets their license suspended for three seconds. Christ, Fred, and I better, I gotta have a couple of martinis. I just killed three people today. Don't worry about it, Frank. I killed five. Let's have three martinis. <laughs> Let's break that down a little bit. That's a big figure. Let's just look at infections in hospitals. Let's just look at C. diff, Clostridium difficile, which is a human poop bacteria, okay? Center for Disease Control. We're looking at the March 1998, a yearly figure. Center for Disease Control. Not me. I'm just a reporter here. Two million Americans are infected in hospitals each year, yearly, from C. diff, because doctors don't wash their hands after they go potty. The human poop bacteria. Of these two million infections each year in hospitals alone, not clinics and, and private offices, but just hospitals, 90,000 of these people die each year. 90,000 die each year. I'm going to ask you a hypothetical question here. What if North Korea or Iran were to send over intercontinental ballistic missiles with a biological weapon? To our large population centers and infect 2 million people. LA, Dallas, Texas, San Diego, um, Seattle, Washington, Denver, Colorado, uh, places like the, uh, Chicago. Uh, what about Atlanta, New York, New, York, New Jersey, Philadelphia? And infect 2 million people with a biological weapon and kill 90,000. Once. The war! I don't care if you're liberal. I don't care if you're conservative and independent, everybody without flickering an eyebrow would sign off on a declaration of war. They killed 90,000 Americans in one attack. Wait a minute. If you don't answer yes, you're lying and pounding. <laughs> <laughs> so why is it that not one doctor gets arrested? They kill 90,000 every year, government figures. In fact, 2 million in the workplace. They don't even get an OSHA ticket. They don't get the equivalent fine of a parking ticket, for God's sakes. There's been a protected monopoly since 1914 in the Flex Report. Look it up, Google it, Flex Report, 1914. There's been a, a monopoly, self policing, no oversight by any agency. And that same law killed off all their competition. And the worst possible thing that happened right after that was they got insurance. Oh my God. He became an ATM machine before there was an ATM machine. <laughs> We're beginning to get the picture here. But, but, but my doctor belongs to my church. I just love him. Even the mafia goes to church. <laughs> so church presence in itself without what's going on in here doesn't count much, does it? Let's look at a couple more pieces here, then we'll get into diseases. Let's just look at pharmaceuticals, and then we'll look at the financial costs. We're looking at human suffering and death. Let's look at financial costs in, in this one piece here. Let's just look at pharmaceuticals. This came out in 19, excuse me, 2006 and 2006 was a, a report by the Institute of Medicine. Again, the, the ethics watchdog for the medical system, not me. They said, they said, these types of errors occur yearly. These are decimal point errors, but prescribing physician, I only looked at what a decimal point is, but a prescribing physician and by the fulfilling pharmacist. In America alone, each year, yearly, amounts to 1.5 million fatalities and permanent injuries. The street drug dealers only kill 10,000 Americans every year. You're safer by getting street drugs from a drug dealer on the street than you are from your own doctor. This is very, very, very scary. Guess what's going to happen to your kids if you don't take control here? That's what I'm going to show you next. I'm going to show you how to take control. Because if you don't do this, you will be burying your kids. September 7, 2012, it's on the front page of every newspaper in America. Everybody thought this was a government waste study. I uh, use healthcare waste 750 billion, three quarters of a trillion, one third American health budget. So who cares? Right? I can read the article because everybody knows the government waste study. But that's not what the article was about. What the article was about was your position and how he bills your insurance company. What it said was roughly 30 cents out of every medical dollar billed to your insurance company was billed for unneeded care. Things the doctor did to you that you didn't need, but he needed the money, so he did something to build the insurance company. There's no oversight, so it's never looked at as a crime because nobody ever looks at it. They're self policing. Like the mafia boss being put on trial, and everybody in the jury is a member of his family. 
<laughs> I'm talking about a blood family. Who knew about his crime family? Okay. And then they went on to say fraud contributes to this also. Fraud is they just bill for stuff because there's no time to get you in for a procedure. He needs the money now, so he just puts in a bill, goes through, there's no oversight. That's not me. That's the Institute of Medicine. The ethical watchdog for the American Medical Association. Bernie Madoff went to jail for life plus 150 years for a lifetime of fraud. You know, remember the stockbroker? He went to jail for life plus 150 years because over a 30-year professional career, he defrauded all of his investors of $3 billion. Well, here's one trade that, that every year defrauds their customers of $750 billion. And nobody goes to jail, nobody gets an OSHA ticket, nobody gets to find equal to a parking ticket. Nobody has their license suspended for three seconds. When do you get pissed off enough to do something? Any veterans in here? Oh, good, good, good. Let's give them a hand, folks. <laughs> I spent the five years in the Army and 15 years in the Air Force. And uh, so I, I have special love for um, veterans and people who work to save this country from enemies foreign and domestic. Now, when my, my CD came out, my audio cassette tape came out in 1992, in 1998, the State Medical Association of New York invited me to speak to their association meeting where they have continued medical education where members can get credit to maintain their licenses. And they just said, please don't use the title Dead Doctors Don't Lie in your speech. Here's something else. Of it. We want to know what we're doing wrong so we can fix it. Please tell us that, but don't use that title. So I came up with medical mousetrap. Seems kind of benign. So if you want to, if you want to listen to something fun, get that audio camera, the CD, medical mousetrap. In there, I said many, many things, but the one thing that caused havoc at that meeting was they said you have two opportunities to give your life to your country. One's on the field of battle, and the other's in the VA hospital. And remember, I said that in 1998. You have two opportunities to give your life to your country. One's on the field of battle, and the other's in the VA hospital. I mean, the VA doctors were there in that meeting. They ran up the middle aisle screaming at me, you know, profanities at me and wanting the programs and throwing at me. It was like mayhem. And because uh, I was ready to defend myself, right? And so it was recorded and given to the Department of Veterans Affairs. Well, the next year, exactly this, the year later, December 1999, a report was given. Cover story in the New York Times. It was a big story because they had to do the investigation because of what I said. It's a horrible story, but it's got to be told. They said there's hundreds of thousands of minor mistakes made in the VA system in America every year. 3,000 serious mistakes that, re that require the veteran to remain in the hospital for the remainder of their life in a coma, usually from some botched procedure. Of those 3,000 serious mistakes every year, the VA doctors killed, look at the word they use, killed 700 veterans. Now, in Afghanistan, last year, the enemy on the field of battle only killed 375 Americans. The VA doctors killed 700. When do you get pissed off enough to do something? They haven't fired one of those people yet. Oh, they're government employees. We can't touch them. <laughs> oh, if I was a U.S. Surgeon General and head of the Department of Human you know, Health and Affairs, I, I would grab them by the belt and the strut the neck, throw them out in the street, kick them a few times, say, come on, sue me in federal court. Let's see what a federal jury says about what I bring up against you, what you did to those veterans. Come on. Frank, let's go at it. <laughs> Your elected officials don't have the balls to do it. You're in a vote against me. <laughs> See, they're not your representatives anymore. They're their own representatives. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so, if it's going to change, you're going to have to change. You have to be proactive here to save this country. show you one more horror story and we'll get into the diseases. There's a true story, it was a cover article about eight years ago, this is Shar's favorite story, in the Orlando newspaper. We were having a meeting here about eight years ago, and this happened to be the cover story on the front page, Sunday newspaper, the Orlando newspaper. 
about a 28 year old woman, a Hispanic girl, <laughs> from a low income family. And because she was from a low income family, she uh, used the county medical facilities for prenatal care and for you know, pregnancy and all that. And she goes into labor. So the, the hospital she'd been going to, the county hospital, Paige is a doctor. He calls up, remember this is eight years ago, he calls up and says, okay, what's going on? Well, so-and-so uh, is going into labor and um, you're her doctor. Uh, we invite you to come deliver the baby. I'm on the 14th hole here. She was going for it, the doctor told me, I'm the 14th hole, I'm way ahead. And I'm reluctant to come in before I'm finished. I've only got four more holes, so uh, I'll be in a couple hours. There's first baby, start labor, might be 12 hours, right? So he, that's what I was thinking. So they, they page me again about 45 minutes. Oh, this baby's crowning, he's coming fast. And we urge you to get here now because there's no other doctor here. If there's something wrong, she needs cesarean. I mean, she's bleeding. You're the doctor, we're just warning you. you need so he shows up half hour later and he is pissed. Because he lost his beer or whatever it was that he couldn't win because he couldn't finish the game. He marches through the clean room, doesn't scrub, doesn't put on any, any um, clean clothes, doesn't wash his hands. He walks in, he immediately cuts her arms off the elbows, cuts her legs off the groin, and then he delivers the baby. He did it six months later to another woman who disturbed his golf game. He's still working at that hospital in Orlando, Florida. True story. Look it up. This is the most horrible example of what a doctor can do who's employed by a government system. If I were her daddy, nobody could do that to my baby girl of paying the price, right? I would have only been found guilty of temporary insanity. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Now you know the basis of why you need change. And here comes some change. We're going to go fast now because I know you didn't handle it. Let's look at obesity. We already told you it's not a factor of eating too much and lack of exercise. It's a simple nutritional deficiency. But it's one of the things that's breaking America. How many of you have heard of the word globesity? Globesity? Okay, if you have heard that. Um, every country that's on the edge of going from a third world culture to a first world culture, they be, you know, beginning to be industrialized, the first thing that happens to them is they all become obese. Not from increased calories. Not from more Coca-Cola being sent over there with high fructose corn syrup. I'll show you why in a moment. In fact, that's why I've been invited to speak to the United Nations General Assembly in October of this year for an hour and a half on the subject. Cool. You've seen this already tonight, Hell's Kitchen, the cause wrenching cure of obesity. Experts are telling us that 70% of our kids under the age of 12 are overweight, 40% of our kids under the age of 12 are obese, 30 pounds or more of their ideal weight for their height, has nothing to do with lack of exercise, eating too much. It's a simple nutritional deficiency disease. I'm going to give you a clue here. This little girl, three years old, Natalie Hayhurst from Terre Haute, Indiana, was on every news program, TV, radio, and every newspaper in America. Okay? And uh, this was about, I don't know, three years ago now? Three years ago now? And she was famous because she ate light bulbs. And thank God there's no calories in light bulbs, otherwise she'd have been obese. <laughs> so what's going on here? She has the same disease that pregnant women have. Raise your hand if you've heard that pregnant women get cravings and weird appetites. Yeah, and that's why they gain baby fat. They call it baby fat, right? I can never lose my baby fat. I exercise, I cut my calories, and I can't lose that baby fat. Because it's a nutritional deficiency. A couple years ago, I went to Brazil and gave some lectures. Everything there is in Portuguese. Newspapers, magazines, radio, TV. Only one English newspaper, so I would read that every day. And then there's a great story for a pregnant woman who ate 20 bath sponges, who ate 20 bath sponges a day for pregnancy. 
She also ate the, the sand and the parrot poop at the bottom of the parrot cage in her house every day. There's some weird appetite, right? <laughs> Putting sand into the sandwiches, the mother to these bizarre cravings during her two pregnancies. Okay. Now, in animals, particularly horses, they chew on the fences, they chew on the stall rails. This is called cribbing. Okay? This is a little horse and buggy Amish uh, uh, farm barn. I was there to see a bunch of kids with mustard this week. Uh, we deal a lot with mustard in the Amish community. We're, we're reversing it like crazy. And we gave this information to Jerry Lewis five years ago. said, hey, you earned the right to be the one to make the announcement. We found the prevention and cure. And guess what? They fired him. That's why he hasn't done the, the telethon. Oh. I wouldn't give him that. The, the Mustard History Foundation maggots from a dead dog, oh. let alone money, because they fired Jerry Lewis. They fired Jerry Lewis when he brought him the cure for Mustard History. At any rate, you can tell that horse whether he didn't even need to look at it, didn't need to do any blood samples to know that that horse is nutritionally deficient. It's called cribbing in horses. Cribbing in horses equal to munchies and people. Munchies and people cribbing in horses. And horses, for cribbing, we give them minerals, and in three days' time, it goes away. It's much cheaper to give them minerals than it is to rebuild the barn, because they'll leave the barn looking for minerals. <laughs> but humans, instead of letting them go drink um, high fructose corn syrup Pepsis or Coca Colas or Mountain Dew, you give them minerals with their supplements, and guess what? They don't even crave it, they won't even like it. If you gave it to them, they wouldn't drink it. J. 